Hello, everyone. This is Adam Meister, the Bitcoin Meister, the Disrupt Meister. Welcome to the This Week in Bitcoin show. Today is April the 10th, 2020. Strong hand, long-term thinking. Bitcoin is the next Bitcoin. Unconfiscatable, offended by selling. All right, dudes. All right, we've got a very special international show going for you guys. Hello, my elite friends. Anita has returned to the show from Austria. Mauricio is back uh, from Canada, of course. And Eugene makes his debut. He is from Belarus, uh, which has been in the news lately. And uh, I don't know, a lot of you out there don't know about the Belarus uh, Bitcoin uh, world. And I don't, so uh, it's it's gonna be a learning experience today. But let's start off with the big news of the uh, month, the week, the year, I guess here. I'm gonna read you a quote from uh, Mauricio here from his, from his Twitter account. And all these people are linked to below. You can uh, study them bef- below. Please check out their links. Okay, inflation is coming to every developing country outside of the US and fast. A few ideas on what you can do. Get rid of your local currency now. Get US dollars. Don't wait until the stimulus dollars hit the street. Don't store your U.S. dollars in a local bank. They will likely fail. Uh, I also assume that you want people to get Bitcoin also. So, uh, Mauricio, tell us about what's going on. There's a lot of money printing going going on here. Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, Great to be here. Thanks for having us. And uh, great to, I feel very proud to be surrounded by uh, these amazing uh, people on the show as well. The the tweet came basically as a response to what I'm feeling is going to be an impending run-up in inflation uh, that's going to happen globally. Uh, just because of the reaction to this global pandemic, uh, a lot of governments are essentially now printing money to stimulate their economies. Uh, this works really well when you have a reserve currency. So when you print the funds and there is demand for that new currency that gets soaked up by other countries, the inflation is rarely felt. And so there is no real impact into the savings of the people that hold that currency. When you are not a reserve currency country and you print those funds, the effect that it can have is disastrous. Uh, I've lived through it in Venezuela because Venezuela was just essentially uh, became a printing operation for social programs when Chavez took office. What that does when people do not trust where those funds are going, where perhaps the ways in which you send the funds and you try to get it to deliver positive results into the economy, there's corruption checkpoints along the way. That money never gets where it should go. Uh, What ends up happening is people uh, that get access to these early print, freshly printed funds, take the money and run to buy dollars with it because they don't trust what the government is doing with it. What that does as a consequence is that it puts tremendous amount of pressure in the currency and, and exchange rate and inflation starts kicking in. When inflation starts kicking in, everybody wants to start doing the same thing and they start rushing to get rid of their Bolivar. That creates hyperinflation. And in hyperinflationary scenarios, what likely happens is that banks come under tremendous pressure because they experience bank runs. And their lending books become decimated because of the same inflation. And so banks basically end up either failing or getting acquired by the government. Uh, in these scenarios, it very quickly becomes a a cliff. It goes from a slope to a cliff very quickly because people then start trying to sell their assets and there's no demand for these assets. So what I tried to do on this tweet is essentially let people know from kind of the experience that, we, that I lived through that is that the case is that when countries print funds, inflation happens. It's the direct consequence. Uh, when it, the only places where that does not get felt, and it's not because it's not happening, it's just because the effects are limited. It's in reserve currency countries. And the large majority of the, of, of the world countries are not reserve currencies. Therefore, they will probably go under tremendous pressure and a lot of them will likely fail. So I'll stop there. <laughs> well, okay, so you didn't mention Bitcoin in all this. Uh, what, what, what's, the, what's your Bitcoin take? Uh, intertwine Bitcoin into this. Um, the reason I didn't highlight Bitcoin so much on this tweet is because I understand that the people that might actually need this advice um, may not be there in the learning curve for Bitcoin yet. Okay. So 
in, in globally speaking, when you tell people to protect their wealth, uh, if you know Bitcoin and you understand it very well, you will feel confident placing your wealth in Bitcoin. If you don't, you don't have time to learn right now. <laughs> uh, so that was really the, the reasoning for that. All right. So dollar is the best of the bunch you see also. I think it's the most accessible of the bunch. Okay. And I think it's the one that can protect the most people of the bunch. All right. All right. And what do you expect for, I mean, you're in Canada. What, what, what do you expect for the Canadian dollar during this time of uh, <laughs> uncertain time? Uh, well, so we, we've already seen a spike. So uh, in, the, in the last month, we've gone from 1.34 to 1.45. That's a 10% move in a reserve currency. That should get everybody freaking out. Okay. Eugene, you're in a country that's a, a little bit different than Canada and the United States. Uh, what's, what's your take on the money printing that's going on in the world right now? Well, thank you for, for having me on the show, Adam. I really love how you started. I told that, first of all, I need to start with the answer. Uh, by background, I am an economist. And when I'm saying economist, I mean Austrian School of Economics. That's the one economic theory you should know talking about crypto, fiat, government, and economy at all. So, first of all, we have a very strong and unchangeable statement. Printing money or inflation or fiat money, this is the way of rob people, the way government use, uses for robbery. The government has three possible ways of robbing people. First is taxes, the direct way of robbing. Second is the borrowing and not giving back. And the third, the soft way people do not understand how it works, is the inflation, the printing money. Governments has, uh, have uh, uh, captured money uh, during the First uh, World War. And since that, we have been living 100 years in the situation where we have centralized money system and governments have been robbing all the people, all the population on the planet Earth. You know, we, we are, uh, I'm in Belarus right now, that's kind of the former Soviet Republic. When Soviet Union crashed in 1991, 30 years ago, we had experienced a great hyperinflation, not like uh, hyperinflation in Germany in 1922, 1924, uh, 23 after in Weimar Republic. No, sir, but we do not we do exactly know what hyperinflation is like like Venezuelan people do know right now like Argentinian people do know right now so we do feel we do understand how the robbery the government robbery via inflation works well for them not for our wallets that's why I'm here in crypto realm that's why I strongly suggest and encourage people to know his enemy face by face our enemy is government. Our enemy is cent central bank. Whatever central bank, whatever government we are talking about. Fiat money, the printing money. Fiat money is the way of robbery. So that's my statement. And I want to prove for everybody wh whatever, whatever, uh, whatever I do see, whatever I do, I uh, can uh, talk to them via your Pascal. We are show to you. That's, that's, that's the situation we live in. And we need to understand. We need to know about that. And we need to be aware. And we need to use Bitcoin by that. All right. Pound that like button. Now, with that history in mind of your nation, uh, are people interested in Bitcoin yet there? Uh, and considering uh, the uncertain times we are entering now? Eugene? Yeah, that's a question for me. Can yeah, correct? yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, did you ask you uh, about uh, the interesting of Bitcoin in my, in my realm? Yeah, in, yeah. In realm, I mean, yes. I'm, because it, you, you guys have experienced hyperinflation in Belarus before. Yes. Now it's clear we're in a very uncertain economic time. Yeah. Are you getting inquiries about, uh, about Bitcoin from your fellow oh, Belarusians yes. now? <laughs> that's a great question. Nevertheless, besides where, apart from uh, we, population of the post-Soviet Republic, not even Belarus, Ukraine, Russia, we all had the same experience 30 years ago, but the majority of population, they do not understand how government works. They do not understand that the printing money is uh, robbery. They do understand, uh, uh, they do have that experience, but, th but theoretically, they do believe in government like they do believe uh, 
like like a religion you know atheism atheism is religious belief in government so this religious belief it stops their minds to understand that the government robs them and it's hard to, hard to explain they don't even uh, know Austrian economics of course it's a mar marginal marginal or uh, uh, very f f few knowledge of economics uh, in our area and uh, the the number of users of crypto is still very few like it is in the world and even even hyperinflation does not encourage us encourages the majority of people to look on bitcoin and we bitcoiners we do educate people any way we could find p2p peer to peer in any show use bitcoin because government is not your friend government is your enemy that's the situation we it looks like uh, whatever the planet earth we are st in it still beginning all right so uh, belarus are, are still worshiping their government that's uh not going to end too well for them uh, if they don't get into bitcoin now speaking of austrian economics let's talk to a real austrian here anita has returned now she will be discussing her trip to Southern Africa. And since we were talking about hyperinflation, she was in uh, Zimbabwe of all places. So I'm sure she'll have some comments on that. But before we get into Southern Africa, uh, I, I do want Anita to discuss uh, what, what's going on in uh, Austria slash uh, Germany during uh, this situation. Uh, the EU is printing money also. Your, your take on inflation and how governments are are handling uh, the, the crisis right now and what it means to Austria and Germany. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, I'm from a European, Central European country. We always had a quite uh, big social uh, uh, social insurance and all that stuff. So uh, the government and the state uh, is providing us very well in a way. So uh, most people here do not have this, we are against the state and uh, these things. Um, and actually, it works very well, to be honest. Yeah, um, but of the, on the other hand, of course, we also here see okay, now money is. I don't know if it's printed really or they have it somewhere. I don't know how. We don't know. Uh, but it's uh, the. I think the more the critical thing is where is it going? You know, who is getting it? And uh, it seems to be the same in Austria and in Germany. The big companies are bailed out. Yes, we, the, the people, the citizens, we also get some funds. But um, in the end, uh, the big ones will be bailed out again and we will pay it with our taxes. And also the topic of taxes. Uh, I'm not completely against taxes. I think they are important to secure like hospitals, medicine, infrastructure, railway uh, and these things. Um, but the, the question is, how can I uh, infl in, um, influence the way it's used, the money, you know? Um, so uh, I think in Austria, we, we are in the fourth week fourth week of the lockdown now and I'm quite sure that up until the end of April we are going to be in lockdown and now they they want to open the first stores again so uh, next week I think the first stores are allowed to open again um, so yeah we'll see I mean it's a difficult situation and even here although we have such a good medical system uh, the the critical critical uh, like doctors and and nurses and stuff they don't have masks you know uh, and for instance i read that uh, berlin the city of berlin bought masks in in china or somewhere and the us confiscated the masks although they already were on in on the airport and then they went to the us <laughs> So yeah, <laughs> yeah. I actually also heard that uh, that that tale. I, I I haven't looked into it yet. Uh, so yeah. so obviously there's uh, money printing going on all over the world. Has have you gotten more Bitcoin inquiries from anyone lately during this crisis? You know, you would think people want to do, or they're just not no. worried. They're totally confident. Everything's going to be fine. I think it's a general problem. They don't understand Bitcoin. And most of the times in the media, the articles are negative or people talk about uh, Bitcoin and other financial instruments who are like from the old economy, you know, like 
old people like me, uh, but also with an old mind, you know, and these are those who say Bitcoin has no intrinsic value. So what do you want to talk with people like that? You know, they, they just don't understand it or they, they read about it maybe, and then they think they understand it, but they don't. And I think uh, that's a problem. And, and like, um, people don't trust Bitcoin. So they still trust the government. They do what the government says. Oh, so, man. and it's, and it's like, I mean, this system is working for a hundred years now or 200 and 300, the banking system. So they are used to it and it's, it's much easier. And, uh, Compared to countries like Venezuela or Zimbabwe, we have a pretty good working financial system, you know, banking system. <laughs> well, pretty good compared to those countries. It's the, you know, it's incredible, the system, yeah. obviously. Uh, real quick, you did, uh, you, you mentioned people's thoughts. Uh, they don't trust Bitcoin, sorry, sorry. You did uh, tweet about, there was a Der Spiegel article that was pretty good. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. about Bitcoin and that's a major German uh, language newspaper so did yeah. uh, so what did they say in that quick summary of that I mean that that's uh, positive when a, when a big newspaper is writing positive yeah it's great I, I don't know how he did it it's a guy called Friedemann he's the correspondent and he's a Bitcoin expert basically and he's a journalist and he's uh, writing about Bitcoin for many years and uh, he said basically yes uh, Bitcoin also uh, lost value uh, or dropped in price in the last weeks uh, due to the corona crisis like all the other assets also did but this has nothing to do with bitcoin with the technology and with it itself it's just a reaction why, because people needed liquidity and so they sold their assets and uh, uh, he basically says that patience is needed and uh, i mean we know patience is needed in Bitcoin for, for it to develop. And he also said uh, that we see that Bitcoin uh, with its market capitalization is still a small fish in the big pool or in the, in the sea of financial instruments. And, and also one thing which was very good that he mentioned it is that most of the coins that have been sold in the last weeks were only bought in the last year. Yeah. So, people who have a strong hand <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> you know what you that is amazing that that article was in a mainstream newspaper he, he told yeah. the truth that that that's I, I can see why you like that article that's yeah and and, and the spiegel the spiegel is a weekly magazine where one could say this is quality journalism you know this is not a boulevard paper this is where the intellectuals go <laughs> All right. All right. So now, well, since we want to hear about Zimbabwe, I mean, g give us some highlights from B Zimbabwe and Botswana. You're, you're in both. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would like to start uh, with the thing that Mauricio said, uh, corruption. I think corruption is a big or a very important element in the in hyperinflation waves, because um, in Zimbabwe, it's like in Venezuela, I guess that the government or the state or, or the political elite extracts value from the country and its people since 40 years. I mean, okay, we, we, we had to start with colonization. This is also a part. There are many big countries who have interest in the natural resources of Zimbabwe. And Zimbabwe was a, 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 yeah, a, a flourishing country, the breadbasket of Africa, Africa, you know. And in the last 40 years, um, they had this big hyperinflation wave, uh, 2008, 2009, that ended then when they introduced the US dollar as yeah, legal tender, basically. And um, then they used the US dollar. And in these years, the country uh, stabilized. And, uh, but then, uh, magically, the US dollars dried up. Hmm. They were gone. Hmm. Why? Hmm. And uh, so the government introduced bond notes, uh, so the new uh, legal uh, tender in Zimbabwe, and again, uh, the, the paper money ran out. And uh, then in 2019, they introduced a new currency called RTGS. Uh, and that's very funny in my eyes because it's called real-time cross-settlement. So the currency is called what it is. It's just an entry in a database on the bank. So they have this RTGS and um, the paper notes, the SIM dollar. And um, they, they forcefully exchanged 
these US dollar accounts that people had in Zimbabwe and said, okay, from this day on, it's now RTGS. Don't worry, it's one to one. So one RTGS is one US dollar. But of course, people knew that they basically were robbed. And um, now today, the, the, the current rate is one to 43 on the streets. So, and, and they have an official bank rate, which is one to 25. So, yeah, of course you try to get your money to change it on the streets and not on the bank. So that's that. And they, and the surprising thing, I mean, they have so many different forms of money there um, because the US dollar was actually outlawed. So you were not allowed to use US dollar in the last years. Oh my God. <laughs> and, but still people, of course they used it. So if you, 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 for instance, we were in a restaurant, we got two bills, one in SIM dollar and one in US dollar, and we could choose <laughs> how we want to pay. And, now wait, um, but, the, but, the, but the US dollar is illegal. So what they, what they print out for you was semi illegal. So it's not being enforced. Yeah. It's no, not that, that, that's the thing. I mean, uh, the, the, I mean, even more, when I entered Zimbabwe, I had to pay my visa fees in US dollar. So even the, the authorities want the US dollar. You know, I, I had to, when I, I, back in 2016, I was there and uh, Mugabe was in charge then. And it's really unfortunate. He was not a good leader, but these guys are worse. At least they were using the US dollar back then. I mean, this uh -huh. is- Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, Mugabe was a dictator and he, 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 he was a human rights, uh, how do you say? Abuse. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, but in yeah. terms of finances- But, but now- but, yeah. but people thought people thought it's going to be better now, but it's yeah. not better in no, no way. Yeah, no, no not, way. No, it's not. All right, yeah. we'll, we'll get back to, we're going to get to Botswana and we're going to get back to Zimbabwe in a second. I want to, well, I want to show my uh, Venezuelan uh, boulevard here. This is uh, basically toilet paper right now. Uh, I, I, I want to quickly, uh, does anyone have any questions for Anita before we uh, move on real quick? Uh, we'll yeah, get I do have any, any qu uh, one more question. Anita, Please, why? Why did you choose Botswana and Zimbabwe? Ah. Be because in the Bitcoin space, we always talk about how uh, uh, Bitcoin is perfect for countries like Venezuela and Zimbabwe. And nobody has been there, I think, like just private or something. Yeah? And I, I wanted to go there and see what really are the problems there, the obstacles to you. Do people use Bitcoin? Can they use it? What are the problems? And I want to be like an ambassador and tell our Bitcoin community, please uh, build solutions that people there can use because the circumstances are more difficult than here, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. And we're good. We are going to get, I'm going to leave everybody off on a little cliffhanger there. She's going to tell us how they use Bitcoin in those countries later on in the show. So keep, keep that in mind. I want to uh, go to Mauricio real quick and uh because we haven't heard from him for a while and there is a another tweet that you had out there that i wanted to read uh in the last few days the last few days have brought eerie reminders of venezuela the daily presidential addresses watched in collective gas to see the size of your benefit the panic buying empty shelves in some places casa rolazos or clapping for health workers, general restrictions. All right, are you talking about Canada or, or the United States or, or both there? I'm talking worldwide. Okay. Uh, I think this just the, the, what I find fascinating is that human behavior is just constantly repeats itself uh, when we find ourselves in these situations. It's no surprise that hyperinflation magically appears when you outlaw the dollar and everything magically stabilizes when it's legal tender. It's, these things are not surprises. It's also not a surprise that when a government tries to do some funky artwork to say to their people that they no longer have access to dollars, people catch up to it, like Anita very well mentioned. So it's been a constant game of cat and mouse because the population wants certainty and wants to deal away with corruption. And the only way you can do that in a lot of these countries is simply removing control of the monetary supply. And a lot of these governments just won't accept that. Uh, are you shocked by the overall compliance of the general, uh, the average citizen? It seems like there doesn't seem to be much protest going on. Uh, and are you a little worried about, uh, as I am, about people giving up their rights during this time of fear? 
Mauricio. Yeah, sorry, I, I cut off, you cut off a little bit there because of my connection. Do you mind uh, repeating that? Uh, oh yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Are you? I mean, are you surprised by the the general compliance of the population to the new rules? And are, are, do you think there, the government is going to overstep and some of these uh, temporary restrictions will become permanent? Uh, is this a, a time of government overreach? Um, I think it's a time to, to be careful. Uh, I, I'm not surprised at the fact that people are compliant because rightfully people are scared, right? Like it's an unknown virus, it's threatening the lives of a lot of people. And so you basically go into who can protect me and who can protect you is the people that control your, the biggest resources in all the hospitals, right? So you listen, uh, you listen to what they say. Uh, at the same time, it's important to not become complacent, right? Just because they're helping doesn't mean that whatever, everything they're doing is right and that you shouldn't question what they're doing. This really brings to light how much trust there is in a government, right? In, in a macro level, right? And that is why I firmly believe that there's been already spikes of inflation in a lot of currencies. A lot of currencies are starting to show danger signs, like the Mexican peso, the Argentinian peso. Like, look around. Every currency is already showing it to you. And the stimulus hasn't even hit the street. We're talking about the most organized societies in the planet, and the United States is having a hard time, and Canada are having a hard time getting the money into the street. But it's going to get there, and the effect is going to be tamed. What people are not accounting for is what's going to happen when Zimbabwe's money hits the street, when Venezuela's money hits the street, when Colombia's money hits the street. That the, the waves of hyperinflation, I think, are going to be are going to be face melting. So things we haven't seen in the past. Oh wow, face melting! Pound that like button. Remember, all these people are linked to below. There, I'm going to link to Lenin. I'm going to link to Eugene's uh, what he's doing there, and of course, Anita. All her, her podcast uh, about Zimbabwe and everything is going to be linked below. Now, Eugene, you are living in a unique place on this planet right now. In Belarus, they have been very laid back about the, the virus. There, there have not been any restrictions uh, from what we, I mean, it's been written about and the, your leader has been uh, talked down upon. He's, he's played ice hockey. Uh, he's, you know, basically like nothing's really going on. Uh, what have you been doing? What, what's your take on all this? You've got a unique perspective because the people in your country, it appears, aren't panicking at all. Yeah, sounds joking. Thank, thank, thank you for mentioning that. First of all, I need to start my answer with Lukashenko was called the, the last European dictator before Putin came in that space. Now Lukashenko is the second European dictator after Vladimir Putin in Russia. I know very well uh, both countries, Russia and Belarus. I have lived in, in all the countries. So, uh, like the famous Russian proverb says, uh, the both are worst. Um, so, that's the joke. That's the joke. Uh, really, uh, you mentioned that Lukashenko had not declared the state of emergency, the state of quarantine, like, uh, like uh, guys in Sweden uh, uh, did. That's why, that's because the economics. If Lukashenko declares the state of emergency, if Lukashenko declares the quarantine, the Belarus economy, it for free understanding, the Belarus economy is 0.07% of the world GDP. It is very little. It's like zero. Okay? So if this economy would be in a quarantine, it would shrink to zero perfectly. Correct? That's why... We are working, we have no current time, and all the Russians and uh, guys from Europe, they are watching on Belarus and say, oh, yo, yeah, guys from Belarus, you're feeling free. We are not free. We are under dictatorship. Lukashenko has been uh, has served as uh, the president, not serving, <laughs> he has captured uh, his power. In 1994, I was in, uh, in uh, the, 10th class of my school. Now I'm almost 44 years old and he is still at the power, 26 years old. What freedom you want to talk me about? That's the current situation, the local current situation due to economy. And the second thing you need to know that the economy of Republic of Belarus, and Belarus is 9.5 billion, uh, million population totally depends on economy from russia 
uh, more than 50% of import, more than 50% of export uh, connected to the Russian economy. When Russia collapses, Belarus collapses twice more quickly. That's the world we live in. And due to internet, due to online, due to you guys, and due to Bitcoin, we are, and personally, we and my, my peers, we are not suffering as the majority of our population suffers. That's the situation we live in. So, uh, I've got a question. Uh, it, we're going to get cut off here, but I'll, I'll ask you the question and we'll continue in part two, I guess. I, do you think the Russian economy is going to fall apart? The, the oil situation combined with this virus, uh, and I'm sure they're going to print some rubles too, and they've got a dictator. Could we see some really big changes in, uh, in Russia soon? Uh, that's, that's the pain. I know what, what do you want to mention? Russian economy totally depends from oil and gas. Uh, we consider it that, uh, we, we, we did think that Russia has, uh, has a way to influence, has a way, had a way to, to um, establish their power. But recent month, we had understood that the Russian maintenance on the allegate depends on the will of Saudi Arabia. Go ahead, Eugene. Okay. So concerning to Russia, Russia, Russia's power in oil and gas industry, we did think that Russia is strongly established on oil and gas dominance in the world economy. And last weeks after APEC's agreement has not been uh, continued, we had seen that Russia's uh, presence in the world economy, in oil and gas economy, depends on the will of Saudi Arabia princes and kings. And if they do want to punish Russian President Vladimir Putin for not uh, continuing the agreement, they could drastically drop the oil price and the Russian economy falls like uh, from like I fall from skyscraper from uh, from, <laughs> from, from from the cover to, to down. That's that's funny thing, but Russia has no strong fundament on oil, even in oil and gas. And besides oil and gas, apart from oil and gas, Russia has no economic power. The uh, investment situation in Russia is very very bad. Investments are flowing down from Russian economy. And I don't even want, I don't even, uh, I cannot even, uh, can, cannot even predict what Russia's economy will be looking like till the summer of 2020, not talking even the end of 2020. We do prepare for revolution and robbery and for uh, not, not for me, uh, not famine, I don't want to speak about famine, but the population are free. Two, two thirds of Russian population has no money, has no um, money in their pockets to spend a month without work. Now we are all on the quarantine and majority of Russian population, they are employees and they do think that we have unplanned holidays. Okay, we can rest and so on. That's a big failure. And when these holidays will be finished in the April 30, they might realize that their employer no longer exists. Mm. That's uh, a tragedy. And we are living in the asset here right now. I, I just, um, I, I'm glad you, you gave that uh, description of Russia. Because there's so many people in the West that think Russia is this like big, powerful, uh, uh, country, uh, but they're on the verge of uh, economic, uh, r really major economic problems. They're a one-trick pony with the oil and, and such. Uh, so people don't 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 get freaked out about Russia. They're not. They're no China. Now I, I do want to say this with what, everything that you said. Uh, in your part of the world, dudes, if you're listening, get Bitcoin. I mean, that, that's all I can say. <laughs> that's that's really really all I can say. Uh, and, and Eugene, I'm, I'm so glad you're spreading the word about, about Bitcoin there to, to the people. Of all the people, they, they, they need to know about it out there. Now, we're going to go back to, uh, to Zimbabwe here with, with, with Anita real quick. And I, I left everybody off with a, with a cliffhanger.
So how are they using Bitcoin in Zimbabwe? What's the deal? Did you encounter any Bitcoiners down there? Yeah, I tracked and hunted them down in a way because, uh, to be honest, it's not uh, a huge amount of people who is using Bitcoin. So I met with uh, black people, white people, and it's interesting that all the white people who live there I talked to, they know about Bitcoin. And some of them even have it for years. Uh, from the, the black population, I found, I met with an affiliate marketer. He's, he calls himself, and I think he really is, an early adopter. So he's into Bitcoin, I think, since 2014 or something. And uh, then I met with a woman who's a cryptocurrency trader and also an online entrepreneur. So uh, the one, both use it to be paid for uh, digital work they do for companies abroad. So it's a form of international payment and um, it's, uh, they trade with it. So meaning, I think they exchange is also, also to alt altcoins and stuff. Uh, but uh, as you know, I mean, as everywhere, people need money to buy food, to pay the rent. So the most important uh, thing is uh, to be able to cash it out easily in US dollar or in RTGS. And therefore, there are WhatsApp groups, Facebook groups. They are really peer-to-peer, -peer, so people build their own trust groups and then exchange uh, Bitcoin and US dollar. And uh, yeah, some people also use local Bitcoins. Uh, in 2017, 16, 17, 18, there was uh, a uh, exchange called Golix. And this has been shut down uh, in 2017, I think. Uh, because in my interpretation, on one hand, there were many, 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 many scams. And people in Zimbabwe have been uh, yeah, burned by these scams and lost a lot of money. Uh, this is also a problem, so people don't have any trust in cryptocurrencies anymore. And the RBZ, the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe, took this, of course, uh, as a reason to say uh, Bitcoin, the use of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies is outlawed. So, and then they shut down uh, Golix. Yep. And Golix, they, I was told they even had a Bitcoin ATM in Harare in the capital and you could uh, cash out USD for Bitcoin there. And this was the first thing they closed down, shut down, and then also the, the uh, exchange, yeah. I, I do want to say about Golix, I knew the guy who was in charge of Golix. I have not heard from him since it was shut down. So I, I am yeah, cur I'm, I, cur I'm curious to know the real story, what happened uh, there. It, me, me too, me too, yes. And I was going to meet him, but he didn't show up. So actually we had an arrangement we wanted to meet, uh, but he didn't come then. Uh, he seemed to be busy or something. I don't know. Um, uh, I, I yeah. want to ask you, what, what a lot of people don't realize is that uh, you were also in Botswana. Botswana mm -hmm. is a lot better off economically than Zimbabwe. I mean, it's yeah. com completely different. So I, I'm very curious, like what was, what was it like there in terms of big money? It, it's better off, but actually I think also not many people are really using it there because I mean, the obstacles are like, internet connection is very expensive in, in Southern Africa, or maybe in whole of Africa. They, for instance, most people have only social media bundles on their phones. Yep. So you can only use WhatsApp or Facebook. So how do you want to use Bitcoin then, you know? And um, in Botswana, Botswana is actually bigger than Zimbabwe, but they only have 2 million inhabitants. And the Alekanani Itire Leng, uh, I met her, she's the founder of the Satoshi Center there, a Bitcoin lady on Twitter. Yep. And she's doing education, free education uh, for years. And I think it's great what she's doing because she really also, uh, she, we, I, I did a Bitcoin talk in Harare and in Gaborone, so at the meetup. And we then installed Bitcoin wallets on the phones. And, and she really, I mean, she has not many, she doesn't have much money, uh, but also uh, nevertheless, she sends money to the people there so that they have their first fraction of a Bitcoin, you know? And I think that's really cool. Yeah, she has been doing this. She's legendary. Uh, the yeah. Botswana Bitcoin lady has been known for as long as I've been around this thing, uh, yeah. since, since 2013, it seems like I, I, I've yeah. heard of her. And I, I, I want to travel to Botswana one day. I mean, it's, uh, 
more, I mean, we can get into this another, it's, it's more developed. It's more of a, it's a free, more of a free country than Zimbabwe. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> definitely. Uh, all right. All right. So everybody, you've got in-depth podcasts about this. We're going to, we're going to link to this below. Of course, do, do any of you guys on the panel have any questions for Anita before we move on from uh, the African uh, topics of the day? Uh, all right. And uh, just, just uh, real quick, anybody have any questions for Eugene about, uh, about Belarus? Because uh, that's, uh, that's a very a, a curious situation, to say the least. I'm so glad you uh, talked about that. All right. So let's, let's move on to something from last week, actually, that I didn't cover on the This Week in Bitcoin show. It just slipped my mind. But I, I want to bring this up. Uh, we'll start with Mauricio. Uh, you'll, you'll know a lot about this, I guess. Uh, it, it, the acquisition of Binance is going to pay $400 million for coin market cap. Uh, your, your take on that, Mauricio? Yeah, you know, I found, I found the news interesting. I think for, you know, a lot of people um, perhaps think of Binance's business as perhaps just trading fees. Right. And, and maybe when you think about it, when you, when you look at the acquisition on that lens, it may not make a tremendous amount of sense. Um, however, when you look at the acquisition on the side of token listing fees, so for example, uh, Binance and a lot of exchanges make a lot of money by charging money to companies to get listed in their exchanges and to get exposure. Uh, when you look at it from that lens and you look at the traffic that coin market cap has and their, their, awareness or amplification power when you make the top 100 of the top 20 or the top 100, that to me is an instant upsell uh, from a Binance standpoint to get included in all of these lists as part of the package to get my token listed. So, um, and if you're looking on the flip side of that in a business where trading fees are going to get compressed because competition is, is increasing, uh, you're looking at the other sides of your business where perhaps you have a better opportunity so I think uh, I, I, I frame it as Binance trying to create a better pipeline for its token listings. Uh, that's kind of how I reason it. And, and as far as the price tag, man, uh, it's a pretty <laughs> steep price tag uh, to pay for traffic. But uh, I guess if you're flush with cash, uh, you know. Oh, so you, you run a business, you run a, 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 a Lenin, which is a, a Bitcoin business, um, you know, with, with this high price tag, did it at least make you smile? Like, hey, man, I think I got more of a legitimate product than that. they do. <laughs> and, I mean, what's a, did you have a personal take on it? Because coin market cap is a, it's, it's listing uh, altcoins. I mean, it, it tells you how much your altcoins worth. You're, you're doing. I mean, tell the world what you guys are doing and uh, just uh, your, your perspective on, on that price. Yeah. So, I mean, in case from, from what you've been framing, and I guess from what you hear me say, we're pretty obsessive at Lettin about helping people save. Uh, and so everything we build is around helping people save, whether it's uh, Bitcoin, so you earn interest in your Bitcoin account, or you get a loan to buy more Bitcoin through the B2X. Uh, and we're doing and we're adding more and more tools. So we're very much uh, uh, not necessarily, I wouldn't consider us a place where people go trade or speculate. I think it's a place where people go, like, you know, maybe protect their long-term savings. Um, but on the, in the context of what every business does and the value that they bring uh, to, to the industry as a whole, you know, on the positive side, I, I think it's healthy to see good valuations in the industry because it, it, you know, it, it keeps people excited about people willing to pay money for these companies. Um, on the flip side, I think it can be getting a, a, such a high valuation, such a really high bar, right? So if, if you now have to deliver to your shareholders more value than $400 million to, from that acquisition, that becomes a steep hill to climb. So it, it, like I said, you know, it looks great. I, I would, I'm curious to look and check back in six months to a year and see if we, everybody, how everybody feels about what they did with that asset. Okay. Okay. Very good. Well, uh, if they're worth uh, 400 million, you guys are worth uh, a billion. I'll say that. All right. <laughs> now, uh, Eugene, uh, you, you're a Bitcoin maximalist. I think you are. I mean, you're, you're uh, do you even care about coin market cap? The, the, the site, uh, do, do you guys go there at all to, to, to ever check out the altcoins and do you think that's a lot of money to pay for, for a website? And you know the answer. The answer is no, no, no. I do not check the price of Bitcoin. <laughs> Nowhere. No time. I don't even, sorry for my, for, for my, I don't even fucking care about the price of Bitcoin and fiat money because fiat money, fiat system is the self, self system in the final stage of self-destruction. 
it has built architecturally to be self-destructed. And when people do try to measure Bitcoin, the phenomena, they do not even, because a little minority of people read Andre Santinopoulos mastering Bitcoin, and they do not understand how, what Bitcoin is, how Bitcoin works, and they try to put a, a brand new, completely new phenomena in their traditional old system of orientation, centralized fiat system, and they try to measure all the phenomena by a fiat, how Bitcoin, uh, how this goes today or tomorrow. When people talk about fiat price in Bitcoin, I do realize completely that I deal with the guy or uh, girl, lady in general, uh, acting in fiat coordinating system, acting in the old regime, in the old system of understanding. So uh, they try to not to switch, not to cancel their way of thinking. They don't even, they try to, they try to keep it, keep it clear. They try to, um, you know, not say, to change. They don't I, want I, to change, yeah. I, I gotta say, of all the people on the show, you really believe one Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin. You're the correct. very definition. Totally correct. You're the totally very, de correct. that's one of my sayings. One Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin. You don't give a rat's, you know what, about, uh, about dollar valuation, about altcoins. I mean, you're, you're hardcore, man. I, I gotta, uh, I gotta say, I'm very happy I discovered you because just, you know, there's a lot of times you, you, you find people in different countries and they're, they're getting into altcoins. I mean, you're not into that at all, are you? you? No altcoins for Eugene, right? No, I don't even care about altcoins. I use Bitcoin for payments. For uh, I, I have been paid for my services in Bitcoin. I use Bitcoin for paying for, for example, for uh, the nearest Liberland conference, the fifth conference in April 18. Uh, they, sell, uh, they sell tickets by Bitcoin. And so on and so forth. Bitcoin is the best way to make transborder payments. And I am very surprised when I try to explain to uh, some old grown-ups how Bitcoin works. They don't understand. I use the analogy. Uh, just imagine the post office and the email. I try to compare. So the Bitcoin compares to fiat system like email compares to the post, the government post office. And <laughs> even after that comparing, they don't understand the innovation. Bitcoin. I, I am laughing, of course, but that's the situation. We are in still in the beginning. Correct? Yes. Well, I, I, I'll say this. Uh, that there's still people uh, addicted to the freaking post office. They'll learn eventually or they'll just, they'll just leave. Who knows? Um, so I, I won't be asking you about Ethereum 2.0. I'll know not to ask you. That okay. Anita, your, your take on a <laughs> coin market cap being worth uh, $400 million. Uh, do you have any, any thoughts on that? I know you're a big Bitcoiner, so you don't. You don't go over there too often, probably. Yeah, I, I only go there when I do seminars or something to explain to people what Bitcoin is and what altcoins are and what the other stuff actually is about. And they, they should not buy BCH or uh, what Bitcoin Cash or BSV, you know, that there's a difference because people, you know, when you're new, you think you can buy at a cheaper Bitcoin. And I think this is poor. Yeah. So uh, that are re the reasons why I go to coin market cap sometimes. And I'm actually, I don't even know what their business model is actually. Um, and, and also Binance. Binance is not a big name here in, in Germany or Austria. We, we I think Bitcoin.de, uh, Bitpanda, we have the Austrian uh, Coinfinity, so uh, Kraken, but, but Binance for me, I, I it's, I, I know it, but um, yeah, that's it's a not really so big here. that's 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 good to know. I was going to ask that they don't know Binance that well. There, it's that is in, interesting. Uh, in, hey, haven't you, Eugene? Do you guys know Binance out there in uh, in Belarus? Yeah, of course, everybody everybody knows Binance. Everybody worship Binance, and <laughs> in uh, our Russian speaking community, everybody uh, worships Binance too. Uh, CZ uh, came 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 to Moscow last year. And of course, he has fans here, but I don't know him personally. And I do hate all these centralized stories in the decentralized realm. 
I, I think Eugene, not exist. I think Eugene's been affected affected by all the Russian traders out there and stuff. You, you can tell he's in count. There's you know you got, it's interesting you know, to see the different uh, influences uh, depending on what part of the world people people are in. Mm -hmm. This is uh, I, I'm, I'm learning a lot here. All right, let's. Uh, I, I, I know this is the one. This is uh, this week in Bitcoin, but I do want to ask. Uh, uh, Mauricio, real quick, uh, have you been hearing it? I mean, you're on Twitter, Mauricio. Uh, this Ethereum 2.0 stuff, or <laughs> or Bcash having this has been in the news lately. Have you uh, any any take on that? Uh, I've been paying somewhat of attention to the BCH having having. Uh, there seems it seems to be stalled <laughs> an hour <laughs> after the having. Uh, there were no new blocks, uh, so it's it's interesting just because uh, from a reference point uh, to me, I, I think that it's it's great to compare and contrast how much attention the Bitcoin having actually gets compared to these other you know events. Right, it is an event that people are are paying more and more attention to. So, uh, from a technical standpoint, I think it's somewhat interesting to look at the others. Uh, yeah. Maybe just to look at perhaps what could potentially go wrong and how you can preempt that. But um, from a, from a just social uh, behavior experiment, it's also interesting to see just how much attention the Bitcoin halving gets. I think we kind of take it for granted now because it keeps getting more and more attention every time, but that's actually very hard like attention is something that's very hard to keep and maintain and the bitcoin halving has done that progressively and continues to do that so i think as a social experiment it's just it's going in the right direction yeah i'm, I'm glad you brought up the bitcoin having when i asked about the the bcat because okay bcash having we can forget about that that didn't get any attention but what what are your thoughts now leading up to the bitcoin i mean that's the only thing on the horizon now besides the the ethereum 2.0 people and people are going to talk about the ethereum 2.0 but I mean, the big, the big event, um, and, and, and I mean, I guess my question for you is, the, the virus thing was totally uh, unexpected. It took up a huge part of the news. There was a big panic. Uh, some people needed cash, so they sold their Bitcoin. That's out of the system right now. So will people start, uh, will we hear more and more about the halving? And are you excited about the halving? Uh, I'm, I'm ecstatic about the halving. Uh, I actually am very excited about it. The other thing that I'm excited slash worried about a little bit from a, from a global standpoint is that I have, I become and I grow every day more confident that, so every new dollar printed, there might be a ratio of how much of it goes into Bitcoin and that ratio might actually be really small. Of every Bolivar printed, of every Zimbabwe dollar printed, of every Colombian peso printed, of every Mexican peso printed, the percentage of that that goes into dollars or Bitcoin is going to be so high uh, that it's just going to drive up those two assets. Uh, and, and I think what's really going to come to shine in, in a scenario like this, so put yourself in a scenario where hyperinflation starts kicking in. They put restrictions on dollars. They put restrictions on goods, on perishable goods that can be treated as money. So they start putting restrictions on anything that can be treated as money. And what that does is that corrals people more and more into assets that are perhaps harder to seize. And that is Bitcoin's greatest attribute. So um, I just think that this is putting a macro spotlight on the benefits of Bitcoin, every single one of them. But, but you, you really think that in some of these not second and third tier currency countries, that the people who are used to the post office instead of the internet, <laughs> that analogy, that they're going to wake up, enough people are going to wake up with all that inflated uh, uh, Colombian currency or whatever it may be, just pick, pick your uh, second tier or third tier currency, that a lot, that, that's going to flow into Bitcoin. You think those people are going to wake up? Uh, I, I'm not gonna, I don't want it to come out of my, my, my mouth anymore. I want to get Anita's opinion on this. Anita, if, you, uh, if, if all of a sudden, uh, inflation started happening in the local currency, in the currencies that you've witnessed, and people had the option legally to go buy dollars or Bitcoin. What percentage of them do you think, uh, educated or uneducated, would wake up and go buy one of these assets? The thing is, they totally understand what Bitcoin is. And when you tell them about the properties like uncensorable, not inflatable, permissionless, um, they, they immediately understand what it is and they are used to a multi-currency system so they could easily swap. But I think the problem, if it, if, if it hits now, 
it's too early because uh, you know people don't have internet, uh, they they don't have the education, uh, and they don't have trust. So uh, I think if uh, if the price of Bitcoin is not rising now, then how should people like get into this uh, you know the the the, the mode again like uh, formal mode, yeah? Um, because yeah, now it has lost value, and everybody said, "Yeah, you see, uh, it's not an it's it's not an how is it called uh, the asset that it's not um, collected." Store of value. No, no, not store of value. Yeah, store of value, uh, value too, but a correlating asset. So it's not oh. decorrelated. Uh, so I think everybody's waiting for that in a way. But what about dollars? So like, if the if the ATS has started inflating, would people not run to dollars? In Zimbabwe, definitely they do that. Do you mean in Austria? Well, no. I just what I'm trying. What I'm, the, the point I'm trying to make is that most countries, when the currency starts inflating, you run out yeah. of it. You yeah, run yeah. out of it to whether dollars or whether big, whatever you know, you run to, right? Yeah, yeah. And the ones who know the Bitcoin, they'll run to Bitcoin. The ones that can mm -hmm. run to that no one can have dollars, they'll run to dollars. But this is really a matter of you're gonna run. You're gonna look for the exits. Right, mm -hmm. and Bitcoin is just one big exit door. It's it's obviously next to this giant exit door called the U.S. dollar, which at most people are just going to walk through. But in that process, a lot of people are going to get caught by that sideline and say, "I may take some opportunities here and try to discover this." Yeah, definitely. That's also what what one of my interview guests said, who's longer into Bitcoin, and he said, "I think people when they feel the pain, they try to like help themselves and uh, do a bandage around it. And if they know that Bitcoin is a hard currency like the U.S. dollar, or even better, then of course they will want to get it. Uh, so yeah, no, a hundred percent. Yeah." Well, no, no, Sorry, no, 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 no. I was just putting some, the, the last thing I wanted to say was in Venezuela, when I lived through the first rush of virality that the Bitcoin had in Venezuela, it wasn't because people were reading Andreas's book and saying, oh my God, this is like incredible on central mind. Like nobody did that. Do dollars were illegal. So mm -hmm. you could not, you would actually get pulled up in the streets if you had a dollar bill. And if you didn't show a receipt that you bought it from the government, they were gone. And People didn't want to take that risk. So dollars became really risky to hold. So along mm -hmm. comes this thing that you can buy and it's Bitcoin and then you can sell for dollars and get those funds deposited into your Bank of America account. And people were like, oh, what? And I don't have to ask my bank in Panama if I can wire the funds to the US bank. And then if I had to wire this to my friend in China, I wouldn't have to call my bank either. Wait a second, this is great. And so they started learning more and more about Bitcoin. And then that drove them to read Andreas's book. But it wasn't the other way around. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, there's one thing that was also very important. I think what I learned down there is that the branding in a way of Bitcoin, like we have it like this self-sovereign money for the individual, the freedom of the individual. Uh, this should be much more like it's for the community. Uh, it's to, to develop uh, our, our possibilities and the economy and not so much this individual freedom so yeah that was also very interesting to see all right well we, we I, I hope people wake up I, I really I really do but I I don't know I, I but see the Venezuelans perhaps they woke up because they were so darn desperate is every I mean I don't wish desperation upon all these other countries but uh, perhaps that that's that what that's the uh, triggering moment uh, to, to get them into Bitcoin uh, We'll see, you, Eugene. Well, we're getting we're getting here toward the end of the show here, so I should uh, get everybody's uh, final thoughts, uh, their conclusionary remarks, anything that the, any stories they wanted to talk about uh, that they. Uh, uh, but but Eugene, I, I want you to you know tell us what you're up to there. Your uh, your crypto MC, what, what that what that's all about. Uh, but do you see uh, do you see some rubles uh, flowing into uh, Bitcoin soon? Do you, do you, and let's not let's not talk about Belarus because it's so small, like you said. Do do you think uh, Russians and uh, Ukrainians are, are going to be uh, piling more into to Bitcoin now uh, than, than than previously? Now that we were in this problem. Yeah, when check, when I mentioned rebels, uh, specify place. What rebel or do you mean Russian rebels or Bell Russian rebels? Yeah, Russian. Russian, Russian, <laughs> Russian. Okay. Yeah. So, but by the way, Russian fiat system, Belarus fiat system, and Ukrainian fiat system, they are. Uh, they are very similar because they are weak. So we do see a huge trend to increase 
the interest of for, 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 for crypto and for Bitcoin itself in our realm. It, it is not the, the big per, per percentage of the population, but the trend is totally positive because every, everybody understands how it looks like your rubble devalues on tomorrow's morning. You wake up and you see you can buy less than you could buy uh, yesterday. Everybody understand how it works. That's why people, they have a strong incentive to seek, seek the bridge where, where to go, where to switch for. And of course, due to us, due to our education, due to they know me, Eugene Crypto MC, who talks about Bitcoin every 24 hours, seven day a week, 365 day a year. You know, these guys, let's talk about Bitcoin. Why? He, he's educated, he's clever, he's a YouTuber, he's a crypto MC. Why? Just, uh, why, why, why is he talking about Bitcoin every, every, every single day? Maybe it's worth to look for. Let's, let's check out, uh, let's check uh, his, his new videos and let's listen for him or maybe let's meet him on events. That's how it works. The P2P education, the P2P education, the best way of setting new users of Bitcoin worldwide. Due to the internet, we can do it more effectively due to show like your Adam. All right, well, I, I thank you very much for being on today. Uh, you'll be back hopefully, and uh, we got a very unique perspective. Uh, again, not, not many people have heard about uh, but what's going on in Belarus, so thank you very much for that. All right, let's get to Anita. What are your uh, conclusionary thoughts here? Any, uh, any stories you wanted to share? Any, uh, any, just anything you want to say? Mm, I would like to say I went to Zimbabwe and Botswana and I wanted to see if Bitcoin can, could really hold up to its promise like being a tool for financial inclusion because that's the thing I'm interested in it. And uh, I've seen many obstacles that uh, Bitcoin as a, as a technology also uh, has to take uh, so that people are able to use it. I mean, the Lightning Network, I think, is very, very important because people are so poor, they couldn't afford even a fraction of a Bitcoin, like a transaction on the, on the base layer. So I think the Lightning Network is very important. And um, I came back even more, even even more sure of the fact that Bitcoin is the, the one single chance for us to change, uh, yeah, to, to, to do a wealth transfer and to give people a chance who are excluded at the moment. And that's why I'm here and I hope uh, we go further together. Uh, awesome, awesome. Well, check out her series. It is linked to below. Uh, you're doing some great work and uh, that was an awesome idea to go down there to Zimbabwe and Botswana and Hopefully, everyone will be able to get traveling in a regular way again soon. My yeah. Lord, you, you made it in just in time. All right, uh, Mauricio, tell us about Ledin. Tell us anything you want to say, Venezuela stuff. The floor is yours. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, like I said, you know, when we built Ledin, it was really about finding ways to get people to help them save in Bitcoin. Uh, because Bitcoin to us was this amazing tool, uh, essentially, to, to, for people to protect their wealth. I think what's happening right now, uh, what, what has me a little bit concerned is the amount of people that are going to lose their savings uh, just because they live in a country that does not have a dollar reserve currency or a reserve currency, uh, you know, currency to pardon the redundancy. So where my head is at right now is we want to make any, any tool that we can build that help people save and protect their money in hard assets. We want to make that available to them and we want to, we want to use the global reach of crypto so that people basically can get as many people as, as can get to this option and the other piece that i want to add and layer on top of that is that i love bitcoin but like i said my focus right now is trying to do to make help with tools to help people save the fiat system although it's completely broken the way i see it is it's a system of dominoes and so uh, there is one last domino that has to fall and that's a domino that most of the debt in the world is dominated in which is the us dollar uh, so Although a lot of the fiat systems are going to continue to inflate and new money is going to be printed, if you are in a place and if you have friends that do not know about Bitcoin, that do not have time to learn about Bitcoin, I would encourage people to 
basically tell them that there are other avenues that can protect their wealth. And in, in, in these situations, the US dollar can really help. Mm, wow. I, I, hey, you're, you're honest about the situation. A lot of dollar haters out there in the uh, crypto space, but hey, it's the best of, of the fiat out there. There is no doubt about it. There is no doubt about it. All right, dudes. Well, that was a great show. Uh, I hope everybody's uh, enjoying their Passover. <laughs> if you celebrate that or whatever you're doing this Friday, I'm Adam Meister, the Bitcoin Meister, Disrupt Meister. Pound that like button, dudes. Strong hand. Thank you so much, guests, for being on the show. Hey, YouTube, you know, they stopped my main channel, but you're still getting me on the backup channel, people. You're still getting me on the podcast. Just disruptmeister.com. Follow me on Twitter at TechBalt, T-E-C-H-B-A-L-T. It's all about conviction. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We will see you tomorrow. We will see you next week. Thanks again, guest. Bye-bye. See ya. Thanks.